Chapter One of Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Narrator read by Adalda Pinaroles. Phileas Fogg read by Brass Rhino. Passparto read by Will Levine. Detective Fix read by Larry Wilson. Auda read by Jesse Yoon. James Forster, read by Rachel. Stewart, read by Rob Board. Gautier Ralph, read by Todd. John Sullivan, read by Esterman Simonides. Thomas Flanagan, read by Tavarish. Samuel Fallington, read by Kangaroo 692. Lord Albemarle, read by Beth Thomas. A reader, read by Rachel. The Council, read by Marianne. Landlord. Read by Beth Thomas. Sir Francis Cromarty. Read by K. Hand. Posse Guide. Read by Christine G. Yukaf Udall. Read by Mark Chulsky. Judge Obadiah. Read by... Esther and Simonides. Mr. Oysterpuff. Read by Rachel. Constable. By Kangaroo. Policeman. Read by Alex Lane. The Engineer. Read by Marianne. Pilot. Read by Rachel. Purser, read by Rachel. Porter, read by Jesse Yu. Townsperson, read by Rachel. Captain, read by Shiloh Fusello. Elder William Hitch, read by Mark Cholsky. Mormon, read by Esterman Simonides. Passenger, read by Rachel. John Bunsby, read by J. Allen Brown. Conductor, read by Shiloh Fusello. The Honorable Mr. William Battlecar, read by J. Allen Brown. The Signal Man, read by Shiloh Fusello. Colonel Stamp Proctor, read by Esther Ben Simonides. Mudge, read by Thomas J. Rowland. Captain Speedy, read by Esther Ben Simonides. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne. Chapter One, in which Phileas Fogg and Passepartout accept each other, the one as master, the other as man. Mr. Phileas Fogg lived in eighteen seventy two at number seven Savile Row, Burlington Gardens, the house in which Sheridan died in eighteen fourteen. He was one of the most noticeable members of the Reform Club, though he always seemed to avoid attracting attention, an enigmatical personage about whom little was known except that he was a polished man of the world. People said that he resembled Byron, at least that his head was Byronic, but he was a bearded, tranquil Byron, who might live on a thousand years without growing old. Certainly an Englishman, it was more doubtful whether Phileas Fogg was a Londoner. He was never seen on change, nor at the bank, nor in the counting-rooms of the city. No ships ever came into London docks of which he was the owner. He had no public employment. He had never been entered at any of the inns of the court, neither at the Temple, or Lincoln's Inn, or Gray's Inn, nor had his voice ever resounded in the course of Chancery, or in the Exchequer, or in the Queen Bench, or in the Ecclesiastical Courts. He certainly was not a manufacturer, nor was he a merchant or a gentleman farmer. His name was strange to the scientific and learned societies, and he was never known to take part in the sage deliberations of the Royal Institution or the London Institution, the Artisans' Association, or the Institution of Arts and Sciences. He belonged, in fact, to none of the numerous societies which swarm in the English capital, from the harmonic to that of the entomologists, founded mainly for the purpose of abolishing pernicious insects. Phileas Fogg was a member of the Reform, and that was all. The way in which he got admission to this exclusive club was simple enough. He was recommended by the Barings, with whom he had an open credit. His checks were regularly paid at sight from his account current, which was always flush. Was Phileas Fogg rich? Undoubtedly. But those who knew him best could not imagine how he had made his fortune, and Mr. Fogg was the last person to whom applied to the information. He was not lavish, nor, on the contrary, avaricious, for whenever he knew that money was needed for a noble, useful, or benevolent purpose, he supplied it quietly and sometimes anonymously. He was, in short, the least communicative of men. 
he talked very little and seemed all the more mysterious for his taciturn manner his daily habits were quite open to observation but whatever he did was so exactly the same thing that he had always done before that the wits of the curious were fairly puzzled had he travelled it was likely for no one seemed to know the world more familiarly there was no spot so secluded that he did not appear to have an intimate acquaintance with it he often corrected with a few clear words the thousand conjectures advanced by members of the club as to lost and unheard of travellers pointing out the true probabilities and seeming as if gifted with a sort of second sight so often did events justify his predictions he must have travelled everywhere at least in the spirit it was at least certain that phileas fogg had not absented himself from london for many years those who were honoured by a better acquaintance with him than the rest declared that nobody could pretend to ever having seen him anywhere else his sole pastimes were reading the papers and playing whist he often won at this game which as a silent one harmonised with his nature but his winnings never went into his purse being reserved as a fund for charities mr fogg played not to win but for the sake of playing the game was in his eyes a contest a struggle with a difficulty yet a motionless unwearying struggle congenial to his tastes phileas fogg was not known to have either wife or children which may happen to the most honest people either relatives or near friends which is certainly more unusual he lived alone in his house in saville row whither none penetrated a single domestic sufficed to serve him he breakfasted in and dined at the club the hours mathematically fixed in the same room at the same table never taking his meals with other members much less bringing a guest with him and went home at exactly midnight only to retire at once to bed he never used the cosy chambers which the reform provides for its favoured members he passed ten hours out of the twenty-four in saville row either in sleeping or making his toilet when he chose to take a walk it was with a regular step in the entrance hall with its mosaic flooring or in the circular gallery with its dome supported by twenty red porphyry ionic columns and illumined by blue painted windows when he breakfasted or dined all the resources of the club its kitchens and pantries its buttery and dairy aided to crowd his table with their most succulent stores he was served by the gravest waiters in dress clothes and shoes with swan-skin soles who proffered the viands in special porcelain and on the finest linen club decanters of a lost mould contained his sherry his port and his cinnamon spice claret while his beverages were refreshingly cooled with ice brought at great cost from the american lakes if to live in this style is to be eccentric it must be confessed that there is something good in eccentricity the mansion at saville row though not sumptuous was exceedingly comfortable the habits of its occupant were such as to demand but little from the sole domestic but phileas fogg required him to be almost superhumanly prompt and regular on this very second of october he had dismissed james forster because that luckless youth had brought him shaving water at eighty four degrees fahrenheit instead of eighty six and he was awaiting his successor who was due at the house between eleven and half past phileas fogg was seated squarely in his armchair his feet close together like those of a grenadier on parade his hands resting on his knees his body straight his head erect he was steadily watching a complicated clock which indicated the hours the minutes the seconds the days the months and the years at exactly half past eleven mr fogg would according to his daily habit quit saville row and repair to the reform a rap at this moment sounded on the door of the cosy apartment where phileas fogg was seated and james forster the dismissed servant appeared the new servant said he a young man of thirty advanced and bowed you are a frenchman i believe asked phileas fogg and your name is john jean if monsieur pleases replied the newcomer jean passepartout a surname which has clung to me because i have a natural aptness for going out of one business into another i believe i'm honest monsieur but to be outspoken i've had several trades i've been an itinerant singer a circus rider when i used to vault like leotard and dance on a rope like blondin then i got to be a professor of gymnastics so as to make better use of my talents and then i was a sergeant fireman at paris and assisted at many a big fire but i quitted france five years ago and wishing to taste the sweets of domestic life took service as a valet here in england 
finding myself out of place, and hearing that Monsieur Phileas Fogg was the most exact and settled gentleman in the United Kingdom, I have come to Monsieur in the hope of living with him a tranquil life, and forgetting even the name of Passepartout. Passepartout suits me, responded Mr. Fogg. You are well recommended to me. I hear a good report of you. You know my conditions? Yes, Monsieur. Good. What time is it? Twenty-two minutes after eleven, returned Passepartout, drawing an enormous silver watch from the depths of his pocket. You are too slow, said Mr. Fogg. Pardon me, monsieur. It is impossible. You are four minutes too slow. No matter. It's enough to mention the error. Now from this moment, twenty-nine minutes after eleven a.m., this Wednesday, 2nd October, you are in my service. Phileas Fogg got up, took his hat in his left hand, put it on his head with an automatic motion, and went off without a word. Passepartout heard the street door shut once. It was his new master going out. He heard it shut again. It was his predecessor, James Forster, departing in his turn. Passepartout remained alone in the house on Savile Row. End of chapter 1